Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'da habita fillah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Continue on in our study of al-asool of sitta the six fundamentals by Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala with the explanation of Shaykh Zayd al-Madkhali rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatin wasi'ah we reached the second asl from the asul, which is the importance of ijtima and the meaning uh, uniting and having unity and the rejection or impermissibility of uh, tafarraq, meaning to separate or split into groups insects and his beer and we mentioned some of the verses and some ahadith narrations uh, regarding this issue and where we left off in the treaties uh, Sheikh Zaid said in his explanation he said and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said so he mentioned a hadith he said, indeed, the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. And the prophets do not leave behind uh, inheritance, neither dinar nor dirham. They only leave behind knowledge. So whoever takes that, then he has taken an ample allotment. Uh, in this hadith, that is in a sound hadith uh, related, narrated are related in uh, Abu Dawood and Al-Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, Al-Darami, Ibn Hibban, Al-Baghwi in Shara Sunnah, and Ibn Abdul Barr in Jami, uh, Jami Bayan Al-Ilm. Uh, so this hadith narration of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is an authentic hadith and it shows that the true inheritance uh, as far as the inheritance of the prophets, alayhim salatu wa salam, is ilm, is knowledge. Knowledge of the deen, knowledge of how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowledge of how to come closer to Allah, fiqh fi deen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allahu bihi khayran, yafaqo fi deen. Whenever Allah wants good for a person, he gives them fiqh fi deen. And fiqh uh, helps us to practice uh, our religion and understand our religion and to avoid uh, divisions. It comes through fiqh, true fiqh, because true fiqh and wisdom should not cause more division and more enmity between the Islamic Brotherhood, but rather it should unite because now that bayna has been uh, clarified, the truth has been clarified, the Quran has been revealed, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mahfuz, it's protected, then this should be cause for uniting the Ummah. Because the Qur'an, as we mentioned, it mentions, uh, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the first ayah that we mentioned? وَاَعْتَسِمُوا حَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّكُوا Hold on all of you steadfast to the rope of Allah and do not divide. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us with adhering to the rope of Allah, which we mentioned is the religion of Islam in general, uh, the the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he has prohibited us in the same verse uh, from tafarraq, from dividing. وَاَعْتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا Hold on, all of you steadfast to the rope of Allah. وَلَا تَفَرَّكُوا And do not divide. So he has prohibited us from division. So there you have, uh, you have isbat Wanafi, in essence, you have ithbat affirming that we should be one community, and you have nafi a negation, uh, negating di uh, having division. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has commanded us to be one, to be unified, and prohibited us from division, and all of that comes from fiqh fi deen. Really, real fiqh fi deen should uh, bring. And people should be callers to this unification 
uh, based on the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not people who are causing division and splintering and hatred in his bia. And so it's very important for us to have a grasp of that. Then Sheikh uh, Zaid said, Therefore, division within, within the foundations of the religion, rather in all of the religion, is rebuked, and it is not from the attributes of the people of Iman and Yaqeen, certainty. However, it is from the attributes of the deviants and innovators. As for the differing with regards to the furur, the subsidiary affairs of the Sharia, from those issues within which differing is permitted, such as differing in something from the acts of worship or something from the mu'amalat, the manners of interaction, and the likes of that from that within which differing is permitted for the people of ijtihad, meaning the people of independent reasoning, then this does not ob uh, obligate division, meaning this does not mean division. There are some areas in which division is permissible, where there might be one more than one correct view uh, in that the Prophet Wasallam on that issue, his statement was general and it allowed for more than one views or the Prophet Wasallam did something in more than one ways, more than one way and that means that in that uh, particular issue that that differing there, if one person does it one way that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did it and another person did it the other way that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did then there's, there's no harm in that because they're both following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like the seven kira'at uh, of, of the Qur'an the seven different ways of reciting the Qur'an the uh, many, many issues in fiqh as uh, uh, Ben Othimin mentioned he said uh, fiqh aglabuhu dhanni or dhanniya that most of the fiqh rulings are based on the not necessarily clear certainty, meaning that this is, uh, it's not like a nas. A nas is a text. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa aqimu salat. He's ordered us to establish the prayer. That's very clear. We know we have to pray. However, if there is something uh, in the issues of fiqh, for example, on issues on how to pray, whether to put the hands on the, the chest, uh, above the belly button, or so, as some people pray with their hands below the belly button, uh, the Malikiyah, some of them, they pray with their hands on their sides. These issues, I'm not saying that these are all permissible uh, differences, no, because some of them go against the Nasus, they go against the text. If it goes against the text, and the text is very clear, then it, it's not uh, permissible. But what we're talking about is that a lot of fit is that it is uh, the views are based on overwhelming uh, what one believes to be true overwhelmingly. You know, the aglabiya. But not that it is the same as a nus. A nus, it's very clear. There's no... Uh, Nothing is amb ambiguous about it. And so this is what Imam Zaid is making a, a, a point uh, to mention. That in many issues of Mu'amalat and, and even in the Ibadat, on issues in Hajj and issues of Salat and Zakat and fasting, all of these issues in Tahara, that there's many different views from the Fuqaha. And those views do not have to always contradict one another. And those views, depending on the issue, the particular issue, sometimes it can be permissible to have more than one view, meaning that the views are both com compatible with the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. And sometimes one just has stronger adilla. So when we say the stronger evidence, we go with the strongest of the evidence. And that means it's still vaniya because both of them have dalil for the same mas'ala, and they are differing with regards to it. But this is not the differing that you make to deal one another. You consider one, one another muqtadiyah and you divide because of that. So that's what Imam Zaid is saying here. He says, and the likes of that from that which that within which differing is permitted for the people of Ijtihad, then this does not obligate uh, division, nor does it obligate mutual hatred, nor mutual plotting, 
nor boycotting. So when something emanates from the people of Ijtihad, then one must look into everyone's proof and see what he relies upon and what he uses as support. So when the truth becomes uh, evident, even if it be in the issues of furur, then it becomes obligatory to accept it and abandon everything else. So of course we're ordered to follow the truth. We're ordered to follow that which uh, uh, overwhelmingly appears to be the truth from the evidence. The evidence seems to support that more so than the other view. Uh, so the only important issue that it is befitting for us to know is the disagreement within the issues of furur, within which ijtihad is permitted. For those who are capable of research and study, does not obligate, uh, obligate the severance of mutual relations, nor does it obligate mutual plotting. These issues have not come to cause division amongst the people. Indeed, the Salaf would differ in some issues, and everyone from amongst them would have his own opinion. This was because they were people of Ijtihad firstly, and secondly, their disagreements did not enter into the dispraise ikhtilaf, you know, the, the types of differing which was mevmum, uh, which was sinful, which was ikhtilaf tabad, which was total contradiction of one another, or that it affected issues of, uh, of creed of the usul of the religion. And whenever the truth becomes clear in the issues of disagreement, it becomes obligatory to follow it because we're ordered to follow the truth. So whatever the situation may be, the one who is upon the correct position in this disagreement, then he has two rewards. And the one who errs, then he has one reward and is pardoned for his error. This uh, error, this is the situation from the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talking about when the, the, you have the two judges, you have two uh, people of ijtihad. That means these are people of knowledge. These aren't just people just because this Muslim and this Muslim sees things differently. He thinks this is correct, this is correct, uh, and it's all okay, and this one will be rewarded double, and this one rewarded one. No, this is for the people of knowledge. This is for the people of ijtihad. They are people of ijtihad, not just the common Muslim who... Uh, makes judgments and makes rulings based upon their desires more often than not instead of delil and instead of knowing how to use uh, the evidence and make istanbat uh, and, and properly know the context of the evidence. Then the sheikh, he went on, he said, the praise is for Allah and may peace and blessings be upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he began to summarize and review the first two principles. And so he said, so we have previously mentioned that these principles, the six principles, are themes of the clearly evident Islamic Aqidah. Indeed, the author has gathered within them a clarification of the correct belief and an explanation of whatever expo opposes it and negates it. And he has clarified the active application that is obligatory upon those under compulsion meaning the mukhalifin, and they are required and bound to learning these principles. So we're all, we all must learn these principles uh, because they, that's why they are usul, they are foundation principles on how to understand the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by worshiping Him, tabarak wa ta'ala, alone. Uh, and then he said, and they are required and bound to learn these principles. So the first principle has passed, and it is a sound principle and a strong rope. Indeed, it is the obligation to observe sincerity in the religion for Allah, the glorified and exalted, in conformity to his uh, statement. So worship Allah, making the religion sincerely for him, unquestionably, for Allah is for Allah is the pure religion. Letting us know that uh, the first also that we, we studied was uh, was ikhlas, sincerity. And as we mentioned prior to this, that uh, the other usul uh, from these six uh, foundations, they are built upon that first asl, that first foundation principle of ikhlas, because ikhlas is a one of the first conditions for having our deeds accepted in Islam by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That a person, for example, the one who wants to pray, he has to have sincerity and worship Allah alone. His, his worship is directed 
uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And the second condition is that it is in conformity with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning he performed that act of worship how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, did it in accordance with his sunnah. So those are the conditions for having our deeds ex accepted, meaning that they are the foundation of our religion. And with the first asl being ikhlas lillah, sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pure worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having your intention to worship Allah alone, then that makes the other uh, foundations uh, that come afterwards, they are built upon that foundation. And Allah the Exalted said, so whoever desires to meet his Lord, then let him perform righteous deeds and not associate anyone along with his Lord in worship. Indeed, there have come uh, ayat from the Quran and a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ clarifying, elucidating, elaborating upon this magnificent principle. Uh, within this principle, the religion of the person cannot be established and he cannot be from amongst the people of the religion upon the path of certainty, yaqeen, except if he is sincere to Allah uh, in all of his statements and deeds and actions, whether they are done openly or in secrecy. So, ikhlas lillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, they're passed in the lesson that the opposite of this sound principle is shirk with Allah, which consists of two categories, major shirk and minor shirk. So as for major shirk, then when the person falls into it, then his religion becomes futile and his action is nullified and obliterated. This is with the major act of shirk. And if such a person dies whilst he is still doubtful about it, then he will be from amongst the people of the fire. He will not die, nor will he live therein. And this is after the evidence of the revelation has been established against him. And this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ وَنْ يُشْرِكَ بِي وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily Allah does not forgive that you uh, commit shirk with him. And he forgives uh, for others' sins wh whomsoever he pleases. So letting us know that shirk... If you die upon shirk, then you won't be pardoned. If you die upon the major shirk, this is the understanding uh, predominantly of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, that if you die upon the major shirk, that this takes you out of the fold of Islam and uh, you will not be saved from the hellfire, uh, from living and abiding in there eternally. And if a person dies on other than that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he forgives whomsoever he wills. And this has to do with uh, shafa'a. And this has to do with how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with ahla kaba'ir and ahla sagha'ir. And the founding principle with regards to that is inshallah, yaghfirlahu, insha, uh, uh, insha yu'adhuhu. So that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, he will uh, punish them. And if he wills, then he will pardon them. And this is for the other sins, aside from shirk al-akbar, dying on kufr al-akbar. And then he said, and the shirk below that is called minor shirk, and we brought examples of it in the previous lesson, with that which the scholars who follow the text of the book and the sunnah have brought as examples for the practice of a riyah. Riya meaning showing off. And we brought examples of the statements that were dictated by the devils from amongst mankind in the jinn to the common people who do not have any fiqh uh, of the religion of Allah. And at the outset of fiqh in the religion of Allah, in al-fiqh al-akbar, the greater understanding, it is the correction of belief and waging war against everything that opposes the belief such that it negates the basis of the belief or that it negates its completeness. Very important, uh, as Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, I believe, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, is one of the first uh, to uh, coin what is known as Fikal Akbar. He referred to it as Fikal Akbar and Fikal Eskar. Fikal Akbar meaning that it is the, the major fiqh and it refers to Aqidah, Ittiqad. And that's why he has uh, a very famous book, and I have it around here somewhere, 
uh, which is uh, entitled uh, Fikal Akbar, I believe, uh, is the the title of the book uh, by Imam Abu Hanifa, and it clarifies uh, a lot of issues of Ittaqad of Aqidah. And so this is why it's very important to begin with Fiqal Akbar, the greater understanding, meaning Tawheed, Aqidah, what is Shirk, what is Tawheed, what is Ikhlas, uh, you know, what is Iman, Kufr, all of these things to have an idea because this is how one embraces Islam and this is how one can leave Islam. This is your Ittaqad, this is your creed. And that's why we're studying this text, Usul Asitta. So the topic of our lesson is the second principle from the principles of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, which is the obligation of uniting upon the truth. So then he goes into reviewing the second principle, which we just finished, which is uniting upon the truth. This is the affair whose importance Allah has magnified in a statement. So is he who guides to the truth more worthy to be followed or he who cannot guide unless he himself is guided? So what is wrong with you? How do you judge? And there is the statement of Allah, the mighty and majestic, and say the truth is from your Lord. So whosoever wills, then let him believe. And whosoever wills, then let him disbelieve. So this choice in this ayat is not of its regular category. It is only a choice that carries a severe threat for the one who deviates from the path of the truth and the correct position and wallows in the paths of falsehood and their various types. Since there has come after it a severe threat that causes the submissive hearts to be moved and the humbled skins to shiver. It is a statement of Allah, the mighty and majestic, in which he said, And say, the truth is from your Lord, so whoever wills, then let him believe, and whosoever wills, then let him disbelieve. Indeed, we have prepared for the disbelievers a fire whose walls will surround them. And if they call for relief, they will be relieved with water like murky oil, which scalds their faces." Wretched is the drink, and evil is the resting place. Wa'iyya the Millah min dhalika in Surah Al-Kaf, verse 29. So this is for the one who disbelieves, and as such he is deprived of sincerity, and falls into the types of major shirk, which obligates for its doer that he will abide in the fire forever. After that, Allah the Almighty and Majestic said, Indeed, those who have believed and done righteous deeds, we will not allow the reward of any who did well in deeds to be lost. In Surah Al-Kaf as well, verse 30. Therefore, the command to unite upon the truth is a principle from amongst the principles of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, the Salaf al Saleh, and their followers whose actions, whether they are done publicly or in private, do not originate except from the book of their Lord and the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with correct understanding. So from the aspect of the command to unite upon the truth, loving it, call, calling to it, and aiding it, then the prohibition from splitting and differing has come in the noble of Quran, in the noble Quran, and the magnificent and purified Sharia. This is because uniting upon the truth calls for unity, harmony, and unification of the hearts and unification of the word. So when unity upon the truth is not achieved, then there will be no harmony, no unity, and no unification of the Muslims from every area. This is due to the entrance of misguided innovations upon the hearts and intellects of those who che whose chests have become expanded. So at that point, it is inevitable that the people have divided each other into two categories. And he mentions uh, the first category, a category that is the noblest of the categories unrestrictedly. They are the ones who have understand the intended meaning. Uh, and they understood the da'wah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Qur'an and the true da'wah that calls to harmony, unity, and unification of the hearts and unification of the word. So these ones are few in every time and place, so they direct their concern to giving importance to the book of their Lord, reciting it properly, understanding its meanings, deriving wisdoms and, uh, and rulings, and permitting the halal and prohibiting the haram, displaying good manners and morals that have been called for by the ayat of the Qur'an and the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ from purified etiquette and noble and sunni manners and good dealings in which the doer follows the example of the noble messengers and magnificent prophets of Allah ﷺ, drawing closer thereby to Allah, the possessor of... Uh, the possessor, uh, and, 
of Allah the Exalted and Most Honorable Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. This is very important. He mentions that the people are divided into two categories. The first category, he said, these are the people who unite upon the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Madhab of the Salaf. And they uh, practice the Book of Allah, they recite the Book of Allah, they understand the Book of Allah, they have fiqh fi deen, and they practice it and they unite upon that. They are Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. They are uh, against Ahl Firqa. And he mentioned some other points in there that are very important that unfortunately many of the brothers and sisters ignore, even those who try to traverse the the menhaj of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, the menhaj of the Salaf al -Saleh. Many people who try to traverse that path, some of the people who try to traverse that path uh, fall into error uh, with regards to this, that they leave off manners, that we are looking at prophetic manners. The Quran, as he said, the Quran and the Sunnah illustrate prophetic manners uh, and, and what we should be striving for and what is a part of our minhaj. It's a part of our minhaj, a part of our Sunnah. The Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to have good manners. <laughs> When Allah Bidi. There isn't a scale, thing that was heavier on the scale of the uh, uh, heavier on the scale of the believers than good manners, and verily Allah hates wicked and sinful speech. This is from the Son of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how is it we can say that Salafiyah doesn't have manners? Or Salafiya uh, you know you, we shouldn't be concerned about manners. Salafiyah, we should have suspicion, or we should spy on one another, or we should attack the credibility of one another. This is not from the Sunnah of the Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِيَّاكُمُ الظُّنْ فَإِنَّ الظُّنْ أَكْذَبُ الْحَدِيثِ He said, beware of spying or suspicion, because verily suspicion is from the worst of speech. SubhanAllah. But it's as if some of the people, they miss those uh, those uh, ahadith and they miss the ayats in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned on how we should deal with one another ta'awun ala bir wa taqwa wa la ta'awun ala ithmi wa udwan you know cooperating in righteousness and piety and not cooperating in sinfulness in enmity and hatred so very very important for us to understand and to uh, give uh, everything its rightful place and understand that that's from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of those things, all the aspects of the deen are the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All the as aspects of the deen are the menhaj of the Salaf al -Salih that we are trying to follow, that we must follow. And that's very important. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, <laughs> The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, There won't cease to be a group from my nation that continues to be on the truth. Uh, on, until the day, uh, till the hour is established. In another narration, no one will harm them who differs with them or who uh, uh, tries to deceive them. So it lets us know that Ahlul Sunnah will be present with or without us. So we want to make sure that we're from Ahlul Sunnah, that we are trying to follow the menage of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we're not going astray, and we're sticking to these usul, ikhlas lillah, and the second one being that we're striving to unite the Ummah based on the Book of Allah and the Son of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the understanding of the Salaf of this Ummah. And the second category that uh, the Shaykh mentions, he said a category that opposes this category in every time and place. These are, mean, these are the people who embrace uh, differing and hezbiya. They are people who have turned away from the truth and from understanding it due to them being distanced from the wise remembrance. And they wallow in the paths of misguidance, innovations and misguidance in their various manifestations. Along with this, they see themselves as being the people of truth and correctness. Because Ahl Bid'ah, of course, everyone believes they're on the truth. Ahl Sunnah, they believe they're on the truth. They believe they're on the truth. Ahl Bid'ah, they believe they're on the truth. Everyone believes that they're on the truth, but the reality is not in always as people necessarily uh, believe. And he said, being the people, the truth, the correctness, they believe that they are the callers to the unity, unification of the world. They believe that they are the people of harmony, and other than that, from those who speak about it whilst remaining aloof from the truth and the correct minhaj. They remain aloof, uh, aloof from the minhaj of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, which calls to unity and the truth, which is obligatory for the mukhalifin, meaning those who uh, have differed, must hold on to it 
in every action from amongst the actions in every affair amongst the various affairs. This is the category that is compared to the first category and it will have its reward in accordance to whatever it perpetrated from innovation, from inner innovations. Then the dispute developed between them in the first category, Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, those who traverse the Minhaj of the Salaf, they are those who do not allow themselves to remain silent about the innovations that have emerged in their societies. So they strive hard to remedy, refute, and confront the innovations with the Sunnah and its people. They exert every conceivable effort and utilize the utmost limits of their power for this. It is inevitable that they must confront those to whom the truth is concealed and who have become misguided and are misguiding others from the correct minhaj in their various harmful groups. And they will receive whatever Allah has written for them of abundant reward and much goodness if they should bear the burden, remain patient, and reflect in hoping for the pleasure of Allah. They do not do this so that it may be said, so-and-so was patient and reflective. Rather, they do this in hoping for the mercy of Allah and fearing his punishment. So this struggle between the two aforementioned categories occurs in every time and place. There has not been a period of time, just as there has never been a place, nor has there ever been any society that has been free from the struggle. And this is extended up to the current lifetime. So the fortunate one is he whom Allah, the blessed and exalted, has granted the success to follow the path of the righteous. And whoever becomes misguided, then he only becomes misguided by himself. And no one bears the burden of another. And no soul earns something except for itself. So since the affair is like that, then it is inevitable to understand the text of the book and the sunnah with the correct understanding. It is inevitable or it is a must to gain an understanding of what the Prophet wasallam came with in its entirety and in detail. One must begin with the Aqidah and then move on to the acts of worship and understand the rules of de and dealings and transactions. And one must gain an understanding of the Minhaj of Jihad, calling to Allah and commanding the good and prohibiting the evil. And they must strive hard in, in advising which was the path of the prophets and messengers of Allah alayhim salatu wassalam, and the, the rest of those who traverse their minhaj and goodness. So now, after this important summary, we come to the explanation of what is comprised in the third principle from amongst the six principles and from the Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. So in the next lesson, we'll get into the third principle uh, and the very important for us to understand after we have re recapped, we will recap again, meaning that the first two principles, the first is sincerity to Allah, that you must have a class uh, in your worship and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and doing the act sincerely to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second uh, asal or uh, foundation is that the foundation principle of uniting upon the haq, uniting upon truth, uh, uniting upon the book of Allah and the son of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the correct understanding and that standing understanding is the methodology and minhaj of how the Salaf al salih the pious predecessors, meaning the Sahaba, Tabi'een, Witzba'a Tabi'een, how they understood the religion. And uh, likewise, avoiding tafarraq, avoiding divisions. Although there's always going to be a division between haq and batil, as he made an ishara too, as he pointed out, that the truth and falsehood will always uh, be, be different. They will all always differ from one another. So there will always be Hizbiya and groups of Hizbiya who will try to distort the truth and distort Islam from its pristine principles and, um, and innovate in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu said, Whoever innovates in this affair of ours will have it rejected. So that innovation is rejected. And a very important point I want to mention is we have to understand that the people of desires and the people of innovation, that they differ in that they also have different levels. So you cannot say everyone is on the same level because someone is a caller, for example, uh, a scholar of Dioband, 
you know, that's a scholar of the Diobundi uh, uh, creed and Akita or Asheri or Maturidia or something like this is not like the commoner from amongst them. This, the first one, he's a scholar of that Medheb and that Minhaj and that Akita. And so he may be exposed to the truth and follow because of his desires. And he's a caller to that falsehood. Whereas the lay persons, if you will, the common people who follow that method, they may not know. They may not have been exposed to the haq. They may just blindly follow their sheikh or their village chieftain or whatever the case may be. They blindly follow that. So they're, the way we deal with them is different than we deal with the callers to that uh, dawah in Menhaj. Likewise, uh, innovation is of different types and different categories. There's there's bid'ah mukaffara and bid'ah ghayra mukaffara. There's a bid'ah which takes you out of the fold of Islam, bid'ah mukaffara, and there's bid'ah which is an innovation that doesn't take you out of the fold of Islam, but it, it's a distortion of some of the religious principles. And so it's very important to know and understand that. And sometimes some people have light bid'ah, meaning mostly what they believe is the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah. But they differ in some issues of the menhaj, the methodology of how to practice and how to give dawah. So their innovation is much lighter than the innovation of someone who is, you know, like blindly following uh, a Sufi Turk, for example, uh, a Sufi Tariqa. And so it's very important to know and have some understanding of those issues. And that will give you further fiqh in your religion, further understanding of how to deal with people, that you don't just treat everyone the same. And that you, for example, you don't rush to boycott everyone. Uh, that those things, those masail, uh, that they are masail that require ijtihad of the, the person who's going to implement those masail. And they require that that person has some fiqh free deen and that they can look at the masada and the mufasid of making hajr or um, cutting off someone. And all of this requires fiqh free deen and wisdom. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept or good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct is from Allah Anything I said that was incorrect is from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.